So thank you everybody for giving me the chance to talk and get over my nerves of speaking. <laughs> so the talk was going to be something about happiness, which is kind of ironic because I had a lot of suffering thinking about <laughs> giving the talk, but I decided that it's still better to face the suffering that's going to bring more happiness than avoiding the suffering. So it's a very selfish decision. <laughs> but um, I prefer generally when giving a reflection for it to be a little bit interactive. So if I'm rambling on, please feel free to interject <laughs> or to add something, contribute something, because it's not for me, it's for everybody here, right? And you've had a long day. So it should be the end of suffering and not more <laughs> suffering. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's just, um, I guess, the, I, whenever anybody asks me why I came to the path, I tend to say it was uh, because of suffering and looking for an end of suffering. And only recently I've started to think, actually, underlying that is the pursuit of happiness. That's another way to look at it. But I guess usually in the Buddha's teaching, he emphasizes suffering, the way out of suffering, the cause of suffering. But the cultivation of happiness is, you know, the, the other side of the same thing. So just as the cause of suffering has to be abandoned, the cause of happiness should be cultivated. So I just wanted to emphasize this this evening. Because I think we probably miss lots of opportunities to cultivate happiness in our lives and look for something special. So even sitting here now, you know, I'm cultivating a certain happiness in <laughs> getting over my nerves. And what I realized was um, I just need to lower my expectation. Yeah. So this is something that we always, you know, inflict on ourselves. Like we raise the standards so high that it's almost impossible to live up to. And then I went for another enlightenment uh, <laughs> token. <laughs> and guess what I had? Imperfection can be perfection. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> so I thought, no matter what, it will be perfect. <laughs> so, yeah. So I read a nice um, passage in the suttas today. It's in the Arana Vibhanga Sutta which talks about all different kinds of happiness and um, particularly the kind of happinesses of the meditation states. And in there the Buddha said, we need to know how to define pleasure and knowing that should pursue our own pleasure. So this is quite interesting because I guess in the West perhaps especially we tend to feel that we shouldn't be looking for our own pleasure but of course, this our own pleasure is inextricably linked to the pleasure of others and the happiness of others. Um, so at a coarser level, you know, ignorance would obscure the causes of happiness. So w it would obscure the kind of action, thoughts and deeds that we need to perform in order to be happy. So the Buddha talks about this. And um, in a way, the uh, two extremes he mentions in the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta are just two wrong ways of pursuing happiness. So one is the pursuit of happiness through the sense desire, and the other one is through self-mortification. I mean, some people actually think that leads to happiness, and the Buddha went on that route himself for six years until he suddenly remembered this experience that he had as a child where he was sitting under the rose apple tree and just watching the world and just entered a very calm place in his heart, and he realized... Ah, he remembered this experience after six years of austerities and realized that's not a happiness to be afraid of. I should pursue and cultivate that happiness. But this was a huge turning point because until then he was on the other extreme of self-mortification. And so the happiness of the senses the Buddha talked about as a, a low and ignoble happiness. Actually, he used the term filthy happiness, which is quite strong. And uh, I think this is sometimes difficult for us to accept because, you know, what most of us are accustomed to is the happiness of the senses and even fairly simple happinesses or happinesses such as nature or, you know, pleasant sights, pleasant touch, pleasant tastes and all the rest. And yet even these happinesses are not a source of lasting contentment. And I think, I was just thinking while I was meditating why that is and I think it's probably because it's a pursuit, you know, we're always pursuing it and there's always a level of uh, not being content with what we have already. 
So, and, you know, there can be a certain amount of happiness coming from these senses, but it is impermanent and subject to change. And also, if we rely on that too much, when it's not there, you know, we suffer. And another thing I noticed, like, in my own life and in other people's lives too, is sometimes the more you get used to a certain pleasure, say, holidays or cruises, the more you need to, you know, keep on doing that to feel the same kind of pleasure, and yet the less effect it has, you know, you, you're kind of, uh, what do you say, like, you need more and more each time, and it doesn't give the same amount of happiness that it used to give. So it's a kind of an endless pursuit. And, uh, yeah, I mean, this isn't about judging kind of the pursuit of those kind of pleasures, but it's just recognizing that they're not lasting. And there's also a sense of, you know, wanting to own them, wanting to possess them. And this also uh, causes them to lead to suffering. Yeah. But uh, a nice uh, kind of evaluation of happiness uh, by Venerable Analio that I was reading, he divides the hap different kinds of happiness into like ethical happiness, so one side is like looking at what's wholesome and what are unwholesome kinds of happiness. And then the other way he says that the suttas discuss happiness is like a, a um, refinement of the wholesome. So looking at what's to be developed and then refining that gradually. So this is where wisdom comes in. And I think through our practice we kind of learn, you know, which pleasures are more lasting and, and nourishing. So, you know, like in my um, teens, I thought that it was great fun to sing really loudly and disturb all the neighbours <laughs> and dance like crazy. But now when I look back, I realise it, uh, it was a kind of pleasure, but it was more like a, a way to cope with the suffering, actually. And it, there was a lot of agitation in that. You know, but I didn't judge it, and when I started to travel, I went to India when I was 19, and um, and I just went to explore, really. I wanted to know kind of what the meaning of life was, what I was here for. Um, and then I did my first meditation retreat after travelling in all the most beautiful places in the country. I just felt like something was still, you know, missing. And so I did my first retreat and um, nothing spectacular happened. The main uh, happiness that came from it for me was hearing that the Buddha actually discussed the reality of suffering and admitted that there is suffering. This was a great relief. And also that there was a path out of suffering. But I just practiced, you know, with the method. And um, I never tried to tell myself, now I should avoid this, I should go for this, you know, I need to change my life. But I just found naturally after the retreat, I had no desire to even listen to music. And not judging it or condemning it, but there was just that sense of fulfillment and, and happiness within. And um, I guess, you know, the more we practice, the more we have this refined sense of, of pleasure. Yeah, so at that point, I preferred to listen to all the Indian ladies on the bus and the hustle and bustle of life. And now I prefer silence. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, you know, increasingly refined. So, uh, yeah... And the nice message, too, that the Buddha gives is that, you know, if it wasn't possible to pursue happiness, he wouldn't ask us to do it, because it is possible, he asks us to do it. So it is available. So talking a bit about the refinement of happiness, this basically in the suttas refers to the states of samadhi, so the jhana states. But before we even get that far in our practice, we need to look at the cause for those condi for those states. So the Buddha said that happiness is actually the cause for samadhi. So there are some kinds of happiness which are conducive to practice. So one of them is obviously sila, yeah, so non-harming. I mean, the basic premise of all the precepts is uh, not to harm, not to harm oneself or others, but also that the colliery of that. So, for example, not killing, the other side is compassion. And then not stealing, the other side is generosity. 
and the, you know each kind of a positive quality has its own levels as well. So the Buddha said the highest generosity is um, that which adorns the mind. So again, it's looking at the effect it has on the mind and uh, how much happiness it produces. So it's quite interesting to look at the path in terms of happiness because you really get a sense of the Buddha's compassion. You know, he didn't want us to suffer, and everything he set out was just to help us find happiness. But <laughs> like other things which cause happiness or which uh, lay a foundation, some of the things I thought about were. Um, like um, love of nature, or uh, an attunement to beauty, or yeah. Yesterday we went. To, was it yesterday? We went to the creek. Was it yesterday? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so much happiness came to me just from feeling more at one with nature. And I realised often in experiences like this. I think the reason that there's so much happiness is because the sense of self seems to fade. You know, when you have that connection to something bigger than you, to something so powerful as nature, of which we're just a tiny part, you know, and then you feel sort of in touch with your own fragility and actually the, the miracle <laughs> that you're alive at all, you know. And, uh, yeah, I think it's similar with um, practices such as metta and compassion, they tend to dissolve the sense of self by connecting with other beings and it's this kind of connection that uh, that brings the happiness. Yeah. So, yeah, so two particular uh, qualities in there, which are sila, which is the uh, morality, and also faith. I mean, faith is something that causes me a lot of happiness. When we were chanting just now and talking about um, the Sangha is sorrow's destroyer, I just found this so wonderful. Certainly it's been the case in my life that having a, a Kalyanamitta or a wise friend or a wise teacher brings enormous uh, inspiration and confidence that this practice actually works. And I was thinking, you know, in a, in a community like this, where we're all practicing together, that you know, the value of spiritual friendship becomes so clear. And I think one reason is that we all do observe the sila, so we have that trust. You know, we can trust each other and feel safe and feel inspired. You know, by seeing your own potential in other people. Yeah. So this faith and sila is um, talked about in another sutta which is not very well known, actually. and It's called Upanissa Sutta. And it's a kind of... Uh, Ajahn Brahmali calls it dependent liberation. So we have dependent origination, which is, you know, the chain from uh, ignorance right through to craving and suffering and rebirth. And then the dependent uh, liberation starts with faith and sila, and also suffering, amazingly. <laughs> and from there, he's saying that through the sila and through the faith, happiness naturally arises. So there's no need to even wish may happiness arise, because one who has faith, one who has sila, it will be a natural consequence that happiness will arise. So I find this so beautiful because it, it kind of gives a, a proper context for the development of uh, states of calm and stillness you know it's not for us to do the work it's not an act of will but it's a natural consequence of putting the causes in place so for me I mean faith was uh, a huge boost on my path because you know having experienced the gratification of sensual pleasures and beautiful scenery in India and everything you can experience basically I also felt like I saw the danger in that. But I, yeah, I had a friend at the time and he saw the same thing, but he just said, well, there's nothing I can do. And I thought, well, yeah, okay, there's suffering, but there's got to be a way out, you know. And when I heard the teachings, enormous faith arose that actually there is an escape. So, 
Yeah, and then with faith we can uh, really milk it in a way by reflecting on the qualities of Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. And just, uh, you know, how amazing it is that we have the teachings and that the teachings can be practiced and are directly visible to anyone who practices the way. This is such a huge inspiration, you know, because we're no different from people in the time of the Buddha. You know, they could do it and so can we. Some of the contact, conduct of the monks and nuns was pretty, pretty low <laughs> in those days. They had a group of six nuns who went around creating havoc, basically, and disturbing the lay people, <laughs> throwing buckets of toilet contents over walls. <laughs> And, you know, they weren't so different, actually, from us, you know. And we still have the teachings intact, despite it being 2,600 years ago, you know. It's still here for us. And, uh, yeah, another um, practice that I think I tend to forget to do, and uh, my teacher, Ajahn Brahm, has emphasized a lot, is uh, Chaganu Sati, which is uh, reflecting on one's own good conduct, one's own kindness, mm -hmm compassion, even little things, like little things you've done for people during the day or, you know, little efforts you've made on the path, even sometimes when you've avoided doing something, you know, unwholesome. Just chalk it up, you know, reflect on it at the end of the day and try and get happiness from this. And this is already moving away from the happiness of the senses towards a happiness that's basically coming from your own mind, you know. It's a source of happiness that doesn't depend on anything outside of you. So I think, you know, even today I was wanting to remind everybody, you know, of all the amazing service and, and the things that have been happening. I don't know what you're talking about, but presumably it's about supporting the monastery and, you know, the uh, wholesome development of this place as a place of refuge for everyone coming here. And, you know, even if sometimes things seem to get stuck or not really going anywhere, I mean, all the causes and conditions that brought people here, it's just incredible, you know, that we all can be here today and that you made certain decisions in your life that moved you in this way when you could have gone in so many other directions. And just taking time to really reflect on that and allow yourself to feel the happiness, you know, because this is something that I've had to be reconditioned into. There was a really nice talk about, I don't know, two years ago in... Uh, our monastery in Perth, and um, Ajahn Brown was talking about happiness, and at some point during the talk, he said, because uh, I was having a lot of happiness coming up, but also a kind of fear around it, because I think the conditioning is that, you know, I might get attached, or maybe it won't last, or something like this. And, uh, and he said, you know, and if happiness uh, arises, endure the happiness and I didn't expect this. <laughs> and I just got kind of chills because it was exactly, I completely knew what he meant. It was like, wow, you know, we have to let that be too. You know, it's like letting go into the happiness, which doesn't mean like letting go of it. It just means letting it be there and letting it like suffuse the body and the mind. So this is kind of the, the deepening of the sermon to practice, just allowing these experiences to happen if they happen, you know. And um, another really useful teaching he gave was to just notice delight, <laughs> which is kind of quite a vague word in a way. But um, yeah, I practiced with that too. And one day there was nothing much, you know, but I was just seeing the parts in the body and mind that weren't oppressively full of suffering, you know, <laughs> anywhere that wasn't particularly, you know, uncomfortable. And it was just very subtle at first, but because I noticed it, I saw it just develop. And it was really astonishing. It was like just that small shift in the mind, and it was quite overwhelming amounts of happiness coming up. So it was almost like tuning into something that was there all the time, but, you know, you don't sort of care to notice, or you don't even think to look, you know. And I mean, here in California, it's kind of the Deva realm. <laughs> you know, I mean, just the quality of the food. It's quite incredible. I mean, I've never had so many greens since I ordained, actually. Even probably before that, because I didn't have any money. 
you know, and there's so much we do have. Yeah. And even, you know, with things like sickness or like Shannon's suffering from this skin thing from the poison oak and I'm generally suffering from nausea and gastritis. But I was thinking, you know, we never look at all the bits of the body that are okay <laughs> and all the skin that's not got the poison oak rash, you know, or like the bits that don't feel nauseous. So it's just like learning to look in a different way and not always going into the cause of suffering and trying to work it out, but sometimes kind of watering the flowers as well. You know, you don't have to root up all the weeds, you can just like put lots of water on the flowers and that's another way to, yeah, kind of push out the weeds. <laughs> and quite a nice way too. Yeah. So yeah, from joy and rapture, like basically the process gets increasingly refined and um, in the next stage you don't have to will it, but naturally when the mind's suffused with joy it'll start to calm down because you know, you just seek a, a deeper kind of happiness, which is less uh, less agitating. And I don't know, you've probably all had the experience when the mind just calms and, and goes into a much quieter state, and it's actually a, a more sustaining, sort of nourishing happiness. And from there, um, yeah, samadhi naturally arises. So samadhi is not something that, you know, you have to go out and find. It's just something that happens when the, the craving ceases, you know, and you stop trying to control things so much. And also when I've noticed for myself, like when I get involved and start to say, okay, what do I do next to create the next experience that I want? It all falls apart, <laughs> you know, but when I can just let go and step back out of the way, then, then the process is allowed to continue. So this is basically what the sutta is saying. And that from samadhi, when the mind is very um, clear and bright and free from hindrances, the Buddha is saying that uh, wisdom naturally arises. It's just a natural consequence of, you know, being free from defilements. And there's another nice sutta that talks about, um, compares uh, the mind that comes after the jhanas, like out of samadhi as being um, malleable like gold, so it's soft and wieldy and um, it can be shaped basically into any anything you want to create from it. So the Buddha, you know, with his own awakening, he came out of these states and then basically decided, okay, let me direct my mind to um, past lives or to the arising and passing of beings and then to the Four Noble Truths. So the mind is so kind of pliant and flexible at this time, you can really look into any of these areas and sustain the attention on it and, and wisdom will arise. So it's a very nice teaching, you know, because you don't have to... It's, I guess the difference is when the hindrances are absent, you don't have any kind of uh, bias about what you see and you don't have any expectation. So whatever arises is much more uh, genuine. I don't know if that's the right word. Uh, you're not controlling or manipulating. So you're much more receptive to whatever arises, to the characteristics, which is sometimes difficult to bear, you know. When you really see impermanence, I mean, I've had experiences where, you know, everything's kind of so clearly just slipping through my fingers, sometimes it's uh, it's quite bittersweet, you know, and quite hard to bear. But I think when the mind's very, very balanced and nourished by this happiness, it's much more easy to see these truths and even see the beauty in that, you know, that this in a way makes life so much more precious and, um, yeah... You know, our fragility is why we need to care. <laughs> because we're fragile, we need to really care for ourselves and care for everyone else. Hmm. I think if anyone <laughs> would like to contribute anything or ask any question or discuss anything to do with this subject, now could be a good time. Or what happiness means. I have a question. Um, <clears throat> talking about how, say, sense pleasures are not lasting happiness, and 
Mm-hmm. So there's, you know, impermanence and thus, you know, they, they have that possibility or quality of dukkha in it because of the impermanence. So then I was thinking about, say, some of the paramis like generosity or something like that. So I'm wondering if, say, practicing that, like if you're being generous, if that's then inherently producing of, say, happiness or mm-hmm. pleasure or something mm-hmm. that's not, that, that is reliable yeah. and different than, yeah. say, the I think it depends on um, your intention with the generosity, like the level in which you're practicing. Level's not a very nice word, but you know, the Buddha talks about different results from different kinds of giving. So if you're giving purely to get something in return, then it's still a good action, but it's not as good as giving freely, giving without expectation for anything in return. Even if you're giving to sort of get a better rebirth, it's not as high a giving as giving for the sake of giving and with wisdom. So he, he sort of gave a what do you call grade a, graded um, description of generosity and the results of that and he said the highest is that which is an adornment of the mind so I don't know to me that I can sort of get what that means at the felt level you know when you give and you just feel so happy to be giving and the mind is so bright and it's like a freeing it's like a giving away maybe especially if something's hard to give you know um, and I think giving also helps dissolve the sense of self because you're giving up something that is mine, right? You're giving it away to somebody who needs it. So generosity is definitely, um, you know, praised by the Buddha and I think it's one of the um, foundations on which sila is developed. So I wouldn't call it really a sense pleasure, but I think, you know, how far it leads to happiness depends on the purity of the intention. Yeah. What would you say about aesthetic pleasure? The pleasure of seeing nice things, mm-hmm. art? Mm. I guess kind of what I said already. I don't think there's anything innately bad about that you know it's not a moral kind of um, issue but I guess it's just limited in terms of the happiness it, it can provide compared to the happiness that comes just from a pure a pure heart and even a quiet heart at least for me I know that these days I'd rather be quiet and in meditation and not have anything to look at than see nice art however like perhaps at a time when the you know the defilements are there and you feel very i don't know depressed or something like this it can be skillful to go and look at beautiful art or to focus on the beauty if that's a way that you know just gets you out of that mind state so i guess it's something you have to know for yourself how to use and what the measure is for myself i mean the reason i i you know ordained and decided to walk on this path is because i felt like i'd already saturated those kind of pleasures and it just wasn't enough somehow wasn't that you know I don't know that I needed to avoid it or there was any condemnation but just yeah I'd rather look at a mountain or something I just noticed that um, with my practice, there was a period of time, and I don't know if I inflicted that on, onto myself unconsciously, mm-hmm. but there was a period of time where I definitely didn't like, like I would come to my parents, I didn't like music, listening to their music, I didn't like, mm-hmm. um, you know, thinking about shopping or yeah, looking yeah. at uh-huh. things, uh-huh. you know, like beautiful things. And now I'm noticing, I'm actually coming, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm kind of mm-hmm. <laughs> coming back, you know, to enjoying some of these yeah. things. You know, I, mm. I still, I wouldn't say I enjoy mm-hmm. everything that my family 
likes, you know, when I mm -hmm. visit them, mm -hmm. like music and stuff, and movies, but, yeah. like, there is more freedom and mm -hmm. enjoyment. Mm -hmm. Like, I, yeah. I notice that I look at uh, some beautiful thing, and I'm not maybe controlling myself something Yeah, like that. that's I mean, really interesting. A sense of freedom of, like, yeah. looking and enjoying something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or listening beautiful pieces uh -huh. of music and uh -huh. really just kind of mm. taking it in mm -hmm. and, and then yeah. just go on. You know? I know what you mean. Yeah. 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 I think. Um, could it be that you're not clinging so much to yeah. it? Or yeah, maybe that's what it is. Yeah. 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 And maybe you you're more skilled at. Um, getting the pleasure from it, like tuning your mind into what's beautiful in it, perhaps. There is some kind of sensitivity, yeah. like enhanced sensitivity, mm -hmm. you know, to, mm -hmm. to like something yeah, yeah. beautiful or nice. And, yeah, yeah. But you're right, then my mind just goes on, like it doesn't yeah, stay right. with that. So you're not depending on that for your happiness and right. it's not becoming a kind of, it's, really it's not disappointing if there it's... There is a sense of ease. Yeah, like, right. This is very good. Flow. Yeah. yeah. I think that's great. Yeah. I mean, there's no need to forcefully let go of things, you know, as long as they're bringing happiness. I guess what I was talking about with the, um, you know, not listening to music and stuff, maybe it wasn't the right music, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I don't know, I just didn't feel, you know, any need. And also it wasn't there in my environment, you know. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure if I do, I can drop it more quickly too. It's interesting, yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Something changed. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. I think it's important also because, uh, yeah, one of the quotes that I really love, I think it's Ajahn Buddha Dasa or Ajahn Chah says, um, joy at last to know there's no happiness in the world. <laughs> I absolutely love this, because I think it shows that happiness is not separate from suffering. In a way, it's a being able to um, be with the suffering, but not get so pulled in, you know, and um, not expect anything more from it. And like, okay, this is how the world is. The things are impermanent. It's not lasting. Yes, it's not totally satisfactory. And, and that's fine, because I don't expect anything else, you know, mm. and I'm not depending on that in the same way. I mean, that was my big relief when I heard about the Four Noble Truths. It's like, yes, life is suffering, you know, there's nothing wrong with me. It's not like I have to change it. It's okay for it to be that way, and yet, you know, I can still find peace. I can still, yeah, develop wisdom. There's still kindness. In a way, kindness has more meaning, you know, and compassion as well. So definitely, I mean, I think the highest kind of happiness is more like, happiness is a strange word, but I think contentment is more, is closer to what the Buddha means. And that means contentment whether there's happiness or suffering, you know. That's actually higher than all the divine pleasures, because there's all these lists, you know, of pleasures like divine pleasure and pleasures of the jhanas, but the Buddha said the highest one is beyond all of the pleasure and pain. Which is kind of contentment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I might end with a little story about that subject if no one else wants to share anything. About what? About contentment. Uh -huh. I shouldn't give the game away. <laughs> but anyway, it's a little story from Ajahn Brown's book, actually. It's not original to me. So um, he says there's five children and each one has uh, three wishes. So, you know, they have to kind of wish for what they think is going to bring the highest happiness to themselves. So the first one's very, um, you know, kind of naive and innocent. And she just says, oh, if I had three wishes, I'd just wish for... Three different ice creams. <laughs> and then the next one says, uh, Oh, only three ice creams. If I had three wishes, I'd wish for an ice cream and an ice cream factory. 
<laughs> and I don't know, chip shop or something as well. <laughs> and then the second one says, oh, that's not very smart, you know. If I had three wishes, I'd have an ice cream factory, a chip factory, and a billion dollars. So I could buy, you know, anything I wanted, basically. And then the next one says, well, if I had three wishes, I would wish for um, an ice cream factory, a billion dollars, and the last wish... I'd wish for three more wishes. <laughs> so this is kind of what most of us do, I think. <laughs> like we just want more and more and more. So, and then the fifth child said, if I had uh, three wishes, I don't know what she did. She must have wished the same thing for all of them. <laughs> she just said, I wish I was so content, I'd never need any more wishes. <laughs> She's really wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> That's very nice. So may we all be so content that we don't need anything in the world. Mm-hmm. And we have an abundant supply of happiness from within and from all our good actions. And uh, may we learn to cultivate goodness in our heart and share it with all beings. Ndamayang tamagataya sadhu karang tatamase sadhu sadhu